All right, everybody. I want to thank you for once again coming to listen to the Project Ready podcast. Today we have on our guest panel uh, once again Salah Eckhart and Jeff Walter of AECOM and Salas from OAC. Always happy to have them on the panel. Always makes it much more interesting because uh, these are folks who are out in the field doing this every day. And our topic today is what is program management, right? And what is the essential elements around program management? And what are the challenges? So program management, multiple concurrent projects, the regular need to, to see what's going on in those projects. Um, I've also spoken to other clients and they describe it as a master in sub projects. There's a number of ways to look at it, right? But it's all really basically the same thing that you have multiple projects underneath an umbrella of. So I want to pause there because I don't do what Jeff and Sala do. Basically, what is program management? To, to me, it is about uh, setting goals to uh, the outcomes that we want to see. So it, it's part of the, the long-term strategy and, and delivering to that. And then having those multiple projects to create the outputs that are required to uh, achieve the, the short-term and the medium-term uh, goals that then lead to the, the long-term strategy and the outcomes that we want to achieve. So that's how I'm looking at program management. Over to you, Jeff. Thanks, Hala. Yeah, that's a big question there for sure. So, yeah, obviously, program management, you know, you know I think to some degree is kind of an emerging in the AEC industry, is emerging kind of zone of management expertise coming into play. And yeah, I think as Joe mentioned, you know, it's really kind of adding a layer of management on top of kind of a complex. Um, ecosystem of projects and stakeholders, and as Salah mentioned, different uh, business and value requirements across uh, those different stakeholders within a program. And really, you know, that ecosystem's not getting any less complex or any any simpler. It's, it's it's even getting more complex as this whole program management industry kind of emerges. And um, so, definitely, you know, from a from a, a, a digital perspective, you know, certainly I think some of those elements can help support, you know, achieving some of those program goals. Well, th let me ask you a question on a follow-up. And I was remiss in not thank Shaley Modi, who's always on these calls, is on this call today as well. Um, but so one question that comes to mind, why is this emerging? I mean, has this not always been the case where you have an airport being built and you have 10 GCs and three engineering groups? And I mean, how, why is program management uh, emerging to your point of view? Yeah, I mean, I can kind of take first crack at this. I, I think it's, it's and I, I think, I mean, obviously, portfolio management, program management, these have all been, you know, elements within any kind of organization, I guess, in a sense, tracking project uh, level activities and, and, and their performance. But within the AEC industry in particular, I think there's a number of factors why there is more focus on this role um, in the delivery of infrastructure and, and built environment these days. And I think obviously one is related to maybe a bit of labor and expertise shortage um, on the owner side of, of the world. And I think in the delivery of kind of mass amount, amounts of infrastructure under short um, kind of and pressured schedule environments and you know, where funding is, you know, to, you know, the ability to mobilize and kind of uh, programs quickly and, and get funding kind of kicked off, you know, really requires, you know, quite a expertise and a team and kind of an, a, a management of pro a framework approach to delivery that I think owners are struggling to kind of with internal capacity around that. So you see program management as an owner thing, is that correct? And, and owners, their reps, construction managers, et cetera. Yeah, I think that's how I would definitely equate it to, you know, and there's different teams that, that you know, I think deliver program management and doesn't necessarily, um, you know, fit all on the owner side, but it's definitely driven from owner level requirements and needs to manage complexity in delivering a, a number of projects at once. Sala? Yeah, um, I think like a chef's perspective was really interesting and, and great. My perspective comes from inside a, a real estate owner organization and, and being an architect by background, that uh, the industry has changed, that it used to be about building landmarks and individual buildings and, and kind of uh, 
taking the, the project-based approach rather than process-based approach. But now that the industry is looking into a manufacturing industry that is a mass production industry, it's starting to realize that managing large portfolios and expanding the portfolios and, and managing the finance side of things, it requires program management rather than just ad hoc, a siloed project management. And the owners are starting to uh, think about their portfolios um, as an investment rather than as something that is a, a, like a landmark or some, their legacy uh, per se. And that's where the shift is now happening in the industry that we are no longer focusing on individual buildings, even though we are talking about smart buildings and, and talking about individual buildings, digital twins, etc. But now the, the horizon needs to expand to uh, managing larger portfolios and managing uh, smart cities and how things are actually connected and how the long-term strategies of built environment are managed. And that's where program management is the right um, route to take. So, so is this more of a view to like the full life cycle of, of a building, right? As opposed to just building it, oh, we got to hand it off, we got to maintain it. That's why you have Revit. That's why you have... Uh, families, all those other components, and it's that long-term, and then repeatability. Is that the other element that you're basically referencing? Yes, um, and it is like you said, that it's about the life cycle and, and managing the total cost of the life cycle, and that's why I developed the digital building life cycle framework to help people understand that what does it actually mean to own a building or manage a portfolio for decades to come that is not only about the capital investment when you're designing and building something and then having the keys over, you actually have to have a long-term strategy and plan for what you're planning to do with it. And that's where program management helps you achieve the different milestones and, and you're not uh, less drifting <laughs> with, with what you own. So it's a shift in, in the view of what a built asset is, for one. And, and, and Jeff, you had mentioned that you said that if nothing else is becoming even more complex to manage a program. And, you know, this is why programs are kind of new because it's this different look at the full life cycle and ownership, repeatability, modular construction probably feeds into this as well. But what, what's driving the increased complexity to your eye? Well, I think even, you know, building off what uh, Sala was saying on the life cycle approach, I mean, you know, program management, you know, in some ways it maybe becomes synonymous with project management, but I think, yeah, as, as Sala described, program even has a different, um, a different view even beyond what a project management or building uh, would say. So even just that life cycle approach, you know, that asset approach is a complexity in itself. Because it certainly obviously opens the door to a number of different stakeholders along that journey as well. And as well, the number of different types of, you know, data sources and software pieces that need to, you know, from a digital and systems perspective, need to help support kind of program management. But also just as, infra I mean, just again, coming from an infrastructure delivery perspective, you know, as those types of projects are getting bigger, and, um, you know, the consortiums are getting larger in terms of delivering projects and programs, you know, n new types of program management, you know, delivery partner kind of concepts where it's this cross between program management and owner level kind of advisory are starting to emerge. So even within the idea of program management, there's new kind of different zones of expertise that are filling in the whole concept of program management as a whole. So. Um, I know that's definitely uh, a couple of different points there, but I think that's where some of the complexities is. It's really around stakeholders and collaboration, really, and really kind of making sure feedback loop, you know, and also the right information is is available to driving, you know, good decision making on these programs. The way I look, I look at stakeholders, and I think Shelley, you probably do as well. To me, stakeholders are just data sources, right? Their inputs and outputs of data is a stakeholder. And I, I guess, uh, and I'm looking for a confirmation that that complexity is also that opportunity. So as you have the ability to aggregate and bring together different stakeholders and the data that represents, that's a bigger set of data to, to, to wrap your arms around, right? But it's also an opportunity. And so I, I guess a pivot I would have, and uh, maybe I'll turn this over to Shaley. So 
you know, in, in terms of pulling all that information together, because before I go any further, I mean, we all agree that that information and the ability to make sense of it, right, across stakeholders and related systems, that's a big part of the challenge and opportunity. So far, so good. So Shaley, what, what are some of the challenges around just even pulling all of that together in a way that would facilitate program uh, management? Yeah, I would say the biggest difficulty, of course, we've been talking about all the different stakeholders, the data and a lot of different platforms. People are using so many different workflows, different ways of storing the data, how it's all organized. And at a program level, basically, there are multiple projects with different teams using their different platforms and different processes in place. But still, because they're all kind of connected to each other, there needs to be a way that all of this data can be somehow united so that we can see at the program level, of course, just all of the things going on across projects as well, but having some level of consistency to bring that data, basically creating a data warehouse as we've been talking about previously as well. But I think the biggest complexity is when there are so many different platforms in use. Design team is using one software, GCs are using another software. They're all trying to bring all of those systems together. I think that that's a big uh, complexity. And it's multiplicative in a portfolio and a program, mm -hmm. right? You know, each project has six different stakeholders and systems, and then there's yeah, 10 and of they them. all use their own different systems. And yeah, just trying to there's there's no way to kind of at the moment see or have that high level view across all of the different things going on. Yeah, and that ties back to the podcast you guys were on, which was Garbage In, Garbage Out, a podcast we have coming up about what is a data warehouse. And I know sometimes these topics may sound a little bit cute, you know, oh, it's a warehouse of data. Nah, okay. Um, in, in what terms, in what context, in what use is, is and everything does tie back to that. So question, I guess, for the larger group as well. So if the challenge is the opportunity of bringing all this data together, what, what are some paths forward? I mean, there's having a a data plan at the beginning, governance rules, agreement, but I, I want to turn that over to everybody else. Like, how do you resolve and try to move forward to make program management uh, more effective? What we did uh, with my past team is that we started developing the data master plan because there are so many different programs within the portfolio management overall that if, if thinking about uh, what Shadi mentioned about the interoperability and and data creation and data transfer between different tools that people are using for individual uh, points of view, data master plan creates the overall strategy for everyone to understand that what they are expected to deliver for the sake of others that others can then build on top of. And, and when thinking about like large portfolios management that people might have understanding of the other disciplines, but the deep comprehension of a, a subject matter comes from years of focusing on a program. And that's where programs like usability or accessibility, sustainability, affordability, uh, smart environments uh, and um, innovations, uh, they become programs themselves, but then others cannot necessarily be the pseudo experts in those topics. And, and that's where the data management comes to save the overall team and, and save the, the project teams that if they have a data master plan, then you have a roadmap to deliver what is needed at different milestones and the quality of data meets the expectations of those that are using the data. Yeah, there are two things I would add to that too, because what I've seen for one is there's a lack of trust, right, between the different stakeholders. I don't want to give you this information. When are you going to be able to access it? So that I think is an issue um, somewhat out of the gate. And the other issue that I run into, you know, in the field, uh, with clients and prospects is, so you have the data master plan, but in that master plan, I think you're always going to find stuff that's just not going to work terribly well as well. And I think that's okay. You know, uh, it, where am I going with this? So I'll talk to clients and they go, well, if you're not doing a hundred percent of this, you're going to go back to spreadsheets and a file system. You're going to go back to silos. It, it, there, there's, there's a sort of all or nothing uh, attitude that I frequently encounter and so I guess to you, Sal, because it's based upon your topics, is that not also the case that when you're doing the data master plan, you're going to go, all right, this 70% we can handle, these 30% we might have to rekey or do brute force, or maybe we don't want as, that data isn't as valuable because of the lack of fidelity. I mean, how do you address the exceptions? 
What we did is that we kind of created the critical expectations, critical path uh, that then gives the foundation for what must be, uh, but also allows people to have the flexibility for the customization or having kind of ad hoc or workaround processes. Uh, so what we aimed at was to create something that was the ultimate simplicity. What gets you where you want to be as the baseline, and then you can con continue expanding and improving from there. And that way we were not putting any handcuffs on people or, or dictating that they must do something that was against the grain, but just creating what is absolutely necessary for the sake of the, the success of the project and the project team. And, and that way we didn't create something that was uh, only extensive and difficult to manage and was not something that was like an encyclopedia of things and, and something that we felt that would be like super cool to deliver, but it was something that was very refined and, and simplified. And that right. doable to give that flexibility. Yes, doable. Right, and that, that that is that sort of purest element that I always just found kind of weird, you know? It's like it, it, all or nothing. All right, um, Jeff, anything you would add to that? Yeah, I think another interesting area of program management and, you know, where do we kind of start and where do we, and you know, I definitely love those data kind of roadmapping and strategy and architecture ideas. You know, a lot of focus on what are, what contracts, you know, from a program management perspective, how these types of requirements for data kind of across projects and across stakeholders are identified in contracts and this also comes down you know as you guys know the ISO 19650 requirements the compliance capabilities uh, for programs how those all those pieces fit together with, with uh, managing those processes is really important kind of rolling out across a, a, as a program so I think you know, certainly contractually, there's, I've definitely been focused on a lot in terms of, you know, identifying those needs from from those different stakeholders and rolling them up into contract requirements. But I, I know, Joe, you also touched on the uh, change management piece a few minutes ago and really just the shift required. And I think, you know, whether it's project management, program management, it's just AEC as a whole um, kind of trying to reach to new trust levels. And I think this is really important. Something I've seen across program management is more focus on change management and, you know, data organization, kind of culture building. It's really important, you know, you know, everyone understands kind of responsibilities, governance across, you know, these types of environments as well, making sure everyone's on the same page, you know, really wrapping identity around, you know, these outcomes as well. So. I definitely just wanted to back that point up that, you know, that's an important, you know, trend as we kind of, as program management evolves and takes its first steps, you know, that's something to consider for sure. Right. And, you know, be it the data management plan or in our case with Project Ready, which is this sort of scalable data warehouse out of the gate. I mean, one of the ways we present our product is, uh, and this goes down to the contracts, the data master plan, all, and, and our ability to make you sort of ready at the get-go is doing this proactively, right? Because that's the other thing that I've witnessed in the years I've been working and, and servicing the industry is a lot of after the fact, well, we had this project going for three years and now we know. Uh, you always knew, you just waited three years, you know? And so the need for proactivity, I, I think, be it our product, data master plan, contractual agreements as to ownership, and MVP, by the way. Really? Being, Risk as well, risk. For sure. yeah. Right, mm. right. It all ties to that risk because mm. you know it, it, it's something that I've I've said is that you know if you don't do something in our case, you know, subscribe to my software. Um, the risk is known. It, the the risk is known that data will be inaccurate. That you're gonna spend. 20, 30, 40 percent of your day looking for data. You're going to have half your information and not even know what it is until you get sued. And then you have to spend a lot of money figuring out what that is. And that that all does come around risk because the risk is, to my eye, uh, in my mind, not being proactive, not addressing this in contract, not having a data master plan, not having be it our platform or an approach where technology is integrally uh, recognized as part of the project from the get-go. So if we're all in a kumbaya moment here, one of the things I would like to ask Shaley is, so what's the role of manufacturers in all of this? And so for me, a manufacturer is anybody who makes something, right? So Autodesk, Procore, they make software. 
Yeah, I think in terms of the different softwares that we've been talking about with Autodesk, Procore, Microsoft, one key thing is that they are now making data available. So again, it's all different for different manufacturers, but there that's where I think just in general, everybody's heading where using APIs, we are able to access the data, but looking at end users and their day-to-day -day life, that doesn't really make it that much easier because a lot of work is involved in then trying to make sense of the data in a way that would then be helpful. Even looking at a simple use case that a lot of our, our clients are now having where they have two different pro cores or two different Autodesk systems all related to the same project and there's a lot of rework that needs to be done where people need to manually move data from one system to another or create RFIs in two different systems, manage that. So it's a lot of rework and manual handling for which in some cases APIs are available, but it's not very easy to just set that up or basically have end users get that flexibility to make it easier for them. So I think while the industry is heading in that direction, it's it's not very easy for end users right now to just have all of these communications in, in place easily. Right. Because, you know, part, part of my objection has always been is looking as, at data as somehow another divorce from human interaction with it. Right. You know, collaboration through integration, one of our taglines, because I think this is where you're going, Shayla, you can bring all this data together, but there's limited sets. But if people can't easily access it and make that information easily accessible in terms of the work stream of their day, right. it, it's rather a moot point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, one other thing I would throw out there, too, is not all APIs are not the same. Right. You know, this is, you know, it's much like the, the, the pre-contractual uh, agreements, Jeff, right? That when you're looking at a program, you should also take a hard look at the software you're using, right? If the software is, because a lot of software out there, you know, is a thing from the 90s, right? I love the 90s back in the day, but uh, time has moved on. And, you know, this, this, it's in the industry, it's called barrier to exit. So you're going to silo people's information. You're going to grab their information. You're going to make it difficult for them to get to it. So I think this is a real point of consideration. I see this in massively large Companies that have been out there forever. I see this in small startups. It, one of the things I would recommend, agnostic of my product, and then again, we want you to buy the product, yay. But for my CIO hat, I would give a very hard look at the systems I'm going to use and the maturity of their ability to interact, to feed a data warehouse so you can apply AI, so you can manage a program effectively and reduce risk. Yeah, I would uh, completely agree with that on so many different fronts. You know, certainly in the valuation at a program management level, you know, of tools and systems that roll out. And that's certainly kind of on the top of our evaluation matrix is, is looking behind the scenes for sure. And I think it's, it's not only just, yeah, it's not only process and, you know, synchronizing information, automation across systems, but really also even goes back to that traceability and auditability and, and trust in, in data. And, Really, if that is kind of a core approach from a program perspective is to have the capability as an organization to yeah, have a data warehouse and, and um, you know, have kind of an architecture and a roadmap where all those systems, you know, I think that's going to be, that's a benefit, you know, there's a maturity um, on that side of things. Yeah, there's a lot of. Well, we've always used it. It's a great product. Everybody uses it. Yeah. That's not strategic, is it? Yeah. Right. You know, the point of technology yeah. is it changes constantly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's the first filter in a sense from that perspective. Right. right. So, yeah, there's different levels of API quality and accessibility. And, and those are obviously changing kind of constantly in a sense. So you have to be aware of that. But fundamental approaches, you know, if the idea is to trace information and I don't want to say own it per se, but, you know, having, you know, a, a source of truth that you can trust behind, you know, you really do need that architecture to support that. Yeah. Yeah. You have garbage in, garbage out. You have to get something in, <laughs> you know, and you have to get something out. So be it garbage or something great, there's still that requisite element to it. And, and again, I don't divorce, I, I, utterly don't distinguish between technology and stakeholders and systems because it, it is really kind of a, you know, the Borg, if you watch Star Trek, it really is more on the, akin to that these days. 
Sala, let me turn back to you. Any other uh, comments you would have as a follow up on that? I love what you and Jeff are talking about because it's it's kind of a painting me a picture that we are now in the same situation as we were in the past with the industry that this is how we've always done it, but now it's uh, digitalized. And, and what it actually means is that a lot of times people are following what others do and they want what the, the others have without thinking through what is the right fit for their core business and, and the choices that they want to make. And then they end up in a situation where they buy program management services from somewhere, but the program managers, they are producing what they already produced for some other client or multiple other clients. So it's, it's never the right fit because there is not enough understanding of what are the outcomes that are, are meant to be achieved and what the client wants to achieve. And even the client doesn't know what they want because they are just basically following what others have already been doing. So that brings us back to the 1990s all the time because it's like, like a, the, the, what people now say is that let's just rinse and repeat. It's the modern way of saying that this is how we've always done it. So we need to somehow break the cycle and get people to comprehend what they should be doing with their, their data so that they stop data hoarding and start leaning towards data management because then they get the value out from the data that they are collecting or creating. And then they start seeing the value in data platforms and starts really thriving with their digital transformation. And and being a New Yorker, I'm picking up on Jeff's comment, I think it starts with a contract, right? Because <laughs> that's how you get paid. Uh, if the contract stipulates that you have to be able to get data in a certain fashion and time, it has to be orchestrated in a way that AI, predictive analytics, all these things can be applied, that, that legal constraint, right, that's going to drive money, makes the world go around, I think goes a long way to then influencing okay, we're going to have to communicate this contractually that forces the hand of data mapping and then forces the hand of selection of systems that allow stakeholders to come together. Just to jump in here, but that's a, the shift I think, Salah, maybe you even describing there is in a sense, you know, going from an old, maybe traditional approach where you come in with, you know, this is, a, you know, your solution or this is your approach and, and trying to fit it within kind of that, the constraints of an existing environment versus a new methodology, new approach where you're, you know, it's definitely a listening or advisory kind of consulting approach, looking at a longer kind of journey, that kind of concept and, you know, being able to facilitate that journey in different ways as well and in, in different pathways. So I think that's really a big shift I would say within program management that I would love to see more is, is certainly in every program is definitely different as even sound described that there's there's no way one approach could fit any or all program uh, concept so i think it's just natural because of that complexity to be more listening and and consulting and advising as especially as it as applies to digital and systems approach right the program the way to manage the program is one thing, the, the elements that you use to it is quite another. This is why I'm very big on this quote modular approach. On this particular client, on this particular program, it's not, this is what we always use. It's this is what will work best here. And you have a fairly large and increasing palette of solutions to bring together out there that you can then apply strategically because your obligation, my understanding, is to the owner. Not, not to a particular software package or something to that effect that, you know, that you foist on people because that's your comfort zone as a vendor, as a consultant. You're touching my favorite topic, um, like processes re-engineering, Joe, because that's my, my core expertise, that, that applying digital tools on analog processes will not fix anything. The technology is only going to underline and highlight what's wrong with the old process and what has all complicated over the years in the old process. So like, like Jeff said, that the consultants should be used as advisors rather than as someone that is just pushing a button on the software. And, and that's the mindset change that the industry struggles with, that people are not incentivized or motivated to uh, simplify the processes and rethink the processes because the uh, process of re-engineering is really difficult. It's complicated and takes a lot of um, time is like creating a new standard. 
So people shy away from something like that, and they just want to have the quick and easy push a button solution that leads into uh, the situation where people have the best tools in the world, but nothing changes. The outcomes remain the same. And quick and easy long term is difficult and messy, right? It's like jamming too much stuff in a drawer and then you pull the drawer out and you bake your favorite knife that's been stuck in there. Um, I like knives. I like to cook. But yeah, it's just like, you know, and, and the number of times we've had conversations with prospective clients that go, oh, we'll get an admin to do that. That's what we always do. Uh, you know, and, and that's just jamming stuff into a drawer. That's just jamming stuff into a closet and hoping that somehow or another it orders itself when you close the door. One other point on the um, flexibility modular kind of approach, and Sal, I know of, uh, I'd love to hear your perspective on, you know, you know, program management, which, you know, is really, an, in essence, the development, a lot of a potential infrastructure buildings, whatever kind of that program is, eventually potentially could fit into digital twin and downstream kind of, um, you know, life cycle oriented management abilities and capabilities as well you know, maintaining kind of modularity, we're kind of looking, you know, beyond program management into, okay, what is the bigger kind of management landscape, digital twin or whatever those types of concepts are, you know, really they need to almost fit together, right? And though, you know, then when you open a canvas to a digital twin concept where you're adding a whole other layer of potential uh, modularity or different um, stakeholders from perspective, you know, really that doing a flexible design from a program early stage can have those downstream benefits throughout the whole life cycle. Manage the entire project's uh, ecosystem mm -hmm. to be able to bring it together effectively and be able to swap components in and out. For sure. And right through into kind of operations, I mean, like the whole like life cycle of that asset that's developed during that program. So, you know, the maintaining kind of modularity at a, at a core really helps us kind of hand off into these different management areas. Yeah, and I think a pushback you would get is, well, if there are all these different modules and different systems, how do we make sense of it? Through a data management plan, through having a data warehouse that scales like ours, through having contracts that stipulate things. Because it data is only as good as its relationship, right? Uh, and so you can have a modular approach if you go, well, it's always these 20 fields, those 40 fields, these three values all ties back to one then you can have that, that modular approach, a scalable data warehouse, and the ability to manage a full life cycle of an asset. I have one perspective for our listeners that when they are thinking about their program management and, and the digital transformation and adoption to uh, new tools as they are re-engineering their processes is that when thinking about the long-term strategies, uh, there needs to be some kind of understanding of what the priorities are. And that ties back to like, what do they want to pay for? Not everything costs the same. Not everything will get the same allocation of funds, etc. But really kind of deep diving into what is the core business where they want to make money or, or what do they want to support if it's not finance related, uh, what they are all about, but really kind of crystallizing that what do they want to achieve? And that's the key for really understanding how they can start approaching the data management and information management within their programs and, and uh, really start thriving towards the future that they want to achieve. Yeah, it's how we would do any engagement, be it, you know, my old services organization, or what we do here. Uh, the thing I want to add to that is if you have a vision, it's like building a building. If you know what the architecture is going to be, you can start building that foundation. So the other thing I would add to the listeners out there is you have to have some sort of plan, but don't let it overwhelm you either, I would argue, right? There, there are places you can start, right? Which is where you're going, Sal. You got to pick something. It may not be the most expensive, but you get the most ROI, but you have to start and have a plan to do this, I think, as opposed to wholesale incrementally. Although I would like to hear what you guys think of that. That's spot on. It's uh, like uh, the needs change as the, the end users or the clients uh, change. So it's like you're you're spot on that you have a starting point, but they, it's an evolution uh, for the kids to come, hopefully. A and that way, like whatever the priorities are, they they depend on what people want and what the, what the end users and the clients are going to pay for as well. So very elegantly said, Joe. And I think I'll add to it. I 
I mean, I just had a conversation with a client in program management space and definitely on the ground incremental approach, especially when you're dealing with big kind of owner kind of organizations and systems is um, is definitely kind of on the top. But also, you know, connecting that incremental um, agile, I guess, a bit of approach to, okay, what are we going to be looking like in three years? Because typically in programs, those, at least from an infrastructure um, perspective, can last, you know, five, 10 years. Everything that I've been involved with is at least a minimum. Kind of, so you have that kind of view over you know, the life cycle of a program to, you know, put milestones and kind of lighthouses out there. So in three years, planting a vision, you know, for example, that, you know, AI is like enhancing program uh, 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 analysis experience and kind of putting those out there, but then managing that through incremental kind of agile change in a way. So we're seeing maturity in the market in terms of where I'm seeing owners wanting to be from program management perspective. And yeah, really getting teams excited about the future of program management using yeah the full depth of these types of uh, technologies to help support. We're definitely seeing yeah even from a garbage in a garbage out perspective, um, even demonstrated use of AI doing risk analysis, schedule analysis, those types of things within program management as we speak. So I think there's some opportunities to plant those new visions within the structure of program and then yeah lighthouse and kind of build that out that way is a good strategy all right so look thank you everybody for listening thank you sala thank you jeff thank you uh shaley and just you know uh, for what it's worth uh, another one we have upcoming is what is a da- data warehouse it really does tie back to what we discussed today and even if you look at previous podcasts like around how to optimize search uh, this, again, goes back to data. You're searching for what? Information on a program. So as I say pretty much in every podcast, this all does tie together. Uh, and excited to pick up in the data warehouse conversation, which I think is really a, a sort of logical extension of today's uh, podcast. So again, thank you, everybody. And we'll talk to you next time. All right. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Thanks, Shaylee. Thanks, Ella.